for our time tonight then. We shall return to 2 Samuel chapter 22. We're going to look at this long chapter. I want to say three things from this long chapter. So I don't wish to highlight one particular verse. The title I want to give to our meditation tonight is In Reflective Mode. In Reflected or Reflective Mode. Had I been preaching with you last Lord's Day evening, I would have had this chapter as my text not only because we are going through 2 Samuel, but it is an appropriate passage of Scripture for us to meditate upon at the end of the year. But things being the way they were, we will look at this tonight. And it's still, I do believe, an appropriate subject for us at this time of the year. Because at this time of the year you will know that people have a bit more time on their hands. It's usually a time when virtually everyone is in holiday. Not everyone, of course, but there are exceptions. We remember the emergency services today in prayer, and of course they are not on holiday. They never are. They're always on duty to some extent. But you know what I mean. Most people at this time of the year are off work. And because of the weather, because of the darkness, they're inside more than they would normally like to be. And it's a time for reflection. It's a time to look back at the year that has passed, and it's also a time maybe to look forward to the year that has just begun. Well, here we have David, the great king of Israel, in reflective mode. He has penned this song, this psalm that's in here, Second Samuel chapter 22. And we find it virtually word for word in Psalm 18. There are slight variations, but most of the psalm is found in Psalm 18, or most of this song is found in Psalm 18. And it's possible that he first penned it here, and then it was somewhat revised for the Psalter. We cannot be dogmatic about it, and that is not important. We might want to consider very briefly, when did David write this? Well, verse 1 says, David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. We might be inclined to think then that David wrote this psalm then. We're not so sure, because what the text says is David spoke this psalm then. It doesn't say that David wrote it then. So there could be a difference between when he spoke it and when he actually wrote it. Again, it's not really that important, but as we will consider one of the headings, the time when he wrote it could become important to our understanding and interpretation of this song. But David has recorded his experiences here, and he had some tremendous experiences, as we have been noting as we have gone through First uh, and Second Samuel. And it's very interesting to note that First Samuel chapter 2, we have Hannah's song. And here at the end of, or almost the end of Second Samuel, we have David's song. 
And therefore we might look upon these two songs, Hannah's song almost right at the beginning of First Samuel, and David's song almost at the end of Second Samuel as two bookends. And here we find two people praising their hearts out to the living God. And in between these two praises, we have a lot of things that went on. A lot of blood was shed, a lot of fighting, a lot of bad things went on. But there we find this book is bookend by two people who opened their hearts and praised the living God for his goodness and for their experience of this God. Well, as I said to you, I have three things that I wish to say very briefly on this psalm tonight. First of all, and we're taking large chunks of the text here, but from verses 2 to verse 20, we have what we would describe as David's praise. David's praise. Verse 2, he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. And he goes on to extol the virtues of his great and his glorious God. David is, is in some sense taken up with the worship of God. He uses metaphors more and more throughout these sections. And he is praising the Lord his God for the glorious and for the wonderful experiences that he has had. And for the fact that the Lord has delivered him out of all of these things. Every single one. He doesn't rely upon his own arm of flesh. He doesn't rely upon the arm of flesh of Job or his army or his friends or even his enemies. He recognizes that in all these things, it's the hand of the Lord. It's the great God of heaven who has taken him through all these difficulties. And David is the first to lift up his voice and praise to the great God and to give him all the praise and all the glory that's due to his great name. There's one thing really that we need to note here. We're not going to reread it. You can read it again later on. But friends, you want to notice here, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, the God of my rock. He is my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, and my refuge, my savior. You can see surely what we're meant to see here. David knew the Lord personally. David relied upon the great God of heaven and he was able to call him mine. It was my Lord. He had an interest in the great God of heaven. It was not a second hand interest or a third hand interest. He was not living upon past grace or someone else's grace. No. This was a reality for King David. He had in some sense tested and tried. He had tasted that the Lord was good. And he was able to say, this is my Lord and my God. It surely reminds us of the well-known psalm. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. If you take the word my out of it, friends, it doesn't mean anything. But when my is in it, there's, there's the personal approach. There's the personal connection. There's one who has been united to the Lord. There's one who knows him savingly. There's the one who has, been, has had personal dealings with the Lord. And this is why David was so full of praise, not just for his deliverance, not just for the goodness of God, but ultimately he knew God, and God was his God. And the Lord was his Lord, and he could say that. I wonder for ourselves tonight, can we say that? Can we honestly say that the Lord is my Lord? That's what Thomas was able to say. Doubting Thomas, who wouldn't believe when 
the disciples revealed to them what they saw concerning Christ. I will not believe it unless I see it for myself. And the next Sabbath day he was with the disciples. And what happened? Jesus appeared before them. And Jesus spoke to Thomas. And when Thomas saw the marks on the body of Christ, he was able to say, My Lord and my God. It wasn't a second-hand experience for him. He wasn't going to rely on someone else's experience. It was personal. Absolutely personal. And because of that, and because of all the other disciples, it was the same experience for them. They were able then to go out into the world. And they would face all kinds of opposition. And all kinds of hurdles. And all kinds of difficulties. But they never wavered. Why? Because they knew the Lord. They knew that the Lord Jesus Christ indeed had gone to the cross. That he was put in a tomb dead. And the third day he rose again. And what's more, they saw him. They saw him. And no one could change their mind. And that's why they went about preaching Jesus and the resurrection. It wasn't just Jesus and his teaching. Jesus and his miracles. Or Jesus and his example. No, it was Jesus Christ, him crucified and the resurrection. And that is what turned the world upside down. And here we have David, maybe sitting down contemplating. Looking back at all his scrapes. All the hard corners that he found himself in. The impossible situations. And we need to remind ourselves that for at least 10 years, at least 10 years, a decade, David was running away from Saul. Not because he was frightened of him as such, but he was running away from him because Saul was out to kill him. And David had opportunities to, to kill Saul. And when other people would have taken these opportunities, David would not. He would never touch the Lord's anointed. It's very interesting if you look towards the end of uh, verse 1. The Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. He doesn't put Saul in amongst his enemies. David never regarded Saul as an enemy. Or oh, Saul regarded David as an enemy. That's true. But not David. David recognized that Saul was the Lord's anointed. And Saul had behaved despicably towards David. There's no doubt about that. But David never hated Saul. Never. And for ten years he had to run away from him because Saul was out to kill him. And had Saul got an opportunity, he would have killed him. And David had come out of many scrapes, many difficult situations, many things that would have turned other people. David was saved. Not by his own might or not by his own cunning not by his own wisdom but by the Lord and David recognized it and as good friends as we contemplate the year that's just gone that the Lord has been with us he has been good he has been faithful We've had scrapes. We've had difficulties. You've had yours. I've had mine. The Lord has been faithful. And that's the Lord we recommend. That's the Lord we proclaim. This is the one that we come to worship and to adore. The Lord Jesus Christ. The one who said, Never will I leave thee nor forsake thee. That's what he has said to his people. He's always with his people. He will take them through. They will go through difficult experiences. 
Yes, they may even lose their lives, but he will never ultimately perish. The believer will be saved in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. He will take every believer to glory. And if he was to lose one, even one, he would not be the Savior. But he will lose none. None whatsoever. And David was one who could testify to that. The Lord had been good. And therefore, he was one who was going to lift up his voice and praise the Lord his God. I put it to you then, this is a good position for us to adopt, for every single one of us. Because the Lord has never treated us the way that we so richly deserve. Every one of us, to some extent, has experienced and does experience the grace of God. You have. You are a recipient of it. And therefore, we should praise the Lord our God. And in one sense, there's no greater way to praise Him than to lift our voices and to take the psalms that He has given us and to praise the great God of heaven because these things that David has written in Psalm 18 and other psalms, we can sing them because we will experience some of these things. Oh, I don't say we'll have such a colorful life as David. No, David was the Lord's anointed and he had special experiences, but nevertheless, in some real sense, the believer will, in some sense, share in the experiences that David knew and that David came out of and he was able to praise the Lord his God. You may well wonder then, as we think about these ten years, this decade of opposition that he encountered from Saul, why did he have to go through this? Was he not the Lord's anointed? Why had he got to endure this ten years of living like a fugitive, of living in the wilderness, of living in the open air, of hiding himself in caves and all of these kind of things? Why did he have to go through it? Well, you see, the Lord was preparing David. The Lord was preparing him to be a king and to be a leader. And this was one of the ways to do it. To put him through difficulties, to put him through hardships, in order that when the time would come, when he would ultimately be the king over the united Israel, he would be a leader fit for purpose. And the Lord is doing a great work in all of his people. And if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, you can be sure the Lord is working in your life. Oh, we're not going to say we're going to live in the wilderness. We're not going to say that people are after us for our very lives. But nevertheless, God is working among his people. He's always at work. He's at work in the individual we might not be aware of it. But one day, we will know it. The Lord indeed is working. And then David, obviously, when he became king, he would be able to reflect upon these things. And he could see the hand of God that he never saw when he was in the thick of the battle, as it were. He could then see Yes, the Lord taught me a lesson. The Lord is working. And he's working in his people even now. Well then, first of all, David's praise. Secondly, we would notice from these verses 21 to 31, we have David's righteousness. Verse 21, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. It is in this section that we might debate about when David wrote this song. Did David write this song at the end of his life? And is this song 
in the book of Second Samuel towards the end of his life in correct chronological order. Because if it is, we have to bear in mind that David sinned grievously. We don't need to highlight it or to dwell upon it, but you know what happened. He committed adultery with Bathsheba, and he murdered her husband and other soldiers in order to cover up his sin and crime. If, if this song then was written after that, verse 21 to verse 31 are a bit strange. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. But then again, maybe it's not so strange because David would admit that he had sinned and he had sinned grievously. But David had repented and David had learned from his error. Yes, it was a terrible sin and no one's going to deny it. But ultimately, David had benefited from it. And what we have found as we've looked at other parts of the Scripture, and as we've looked at sections of Second Samuel and First Samuel, we notice that very often the Scripture only dwells upon the good points of some individuals. It doesn't totally dismiss the sin of in other individuals. But on occasion, sometimes, it will not dwell upon the sins of God's people. Maybe that is what happened here. Everyone knew about his sin. But generally speaking, what is said here in this verse is 21 to 31 is true of David. He was a man after God's own heart. He was a man who sought to live by the word of God. He sought to be faithful to God all the days of his life. He was a faithful believer. That was the general bent of his life. And if he did write this song towards the end of his life, it would teach us that God... When he sees repentance, and when he sees people putting the, their sins behind them, he is one who forgets them and moves on. We certainly cannot be certain when this psalm was written, this song was written. It is possible that the song was written when David became established as king, when he was the king of the, of the whole nation, when he was at his peak, around the time when he sought out for Mephibosheth in order that he might show the kindness of God to him. It's possible then that this song was written then. We cannot be certain. But the point is, David was able to plead his righteousness. That he was not simply a theoretic believer. He was not someone who had his head filled with knowledge, of scriptural knowledge, of theological knowledge. But the word of God worked in him so that it ordered and directed his life. He sought to live his life according to the word of God. He was not someone who simply came to the house of God, read the word of God, heard it expounded, delighted in it, and then went out and lived his life without any reference to it. That wasn't the case with David. He was a man who knew practical righteousness. When he talks here about this, and of course, let us remind ourselves that although David wrote this, he wrote this under the inspiration of the Spirit, and therefore it comes with the authority of God, the Holy Spirit, as all other scripture does. Therefore, we are to realize that 
David was a man who took the word of God seriously. And it affected his walk. It affected his talk. It affected how he dealt with people. And we can see that principally in how he dealt with Saul. That man who was out to kill him. David spared him on two occasions at least. David would not harm the Lord's anointed. David didn't, didn't want any harm to come to Abner or Ish-bosheth, Saul's son, when they were murdered. He took no part in that. He was sorrowful that, that, that these things happened. Why? Because he was a merciful man. He was a righteous man. And yes, we have made mention of it. He did fall. He committed adultery. He committed a dreadful crime. But he learned from it. And his life changed as a result of it. And therefore he could talk about his righteousness. Not self-righteousness. But a righteousness that was given to him by God himself. And he walked according to that righteousness. We might have the New Testament example. What is it? We find it in Hebrews Without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. That's the New Testament equivalent. We are to not simply talk the talk, but we are to walk the walk. It's got to be clear and evident that we belong to the Lord Jesus. It was said that the early disciples, they took note of them, that they had been with Jesus. Friends, Ask yourself, does anyone know you go to the house of God? Does anyone know you attend a place of worship? Does anyone know that you're under the means of grace? Does anyone know that the word of God is read and preached to you? And that the claims of Christ are pressed upon you that you must live according to the word of God? That could be said of David. That could be said. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, verse 22, and have not wickedly departed from my God. This is a time to be in reflective mode. Last year's gone. A year's a long time to think over. How have we feared? How is our life? How is our living? How does it accord or compare with the word of God? We are to love our enemies. That's a very high standard. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's a standard beyond us, but that's what's required of us. That's the mark. That's what it is to be a citizen of the kingdom. No wonder he started his Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As we're in reflective mode, as we look at the year that's gone and as we look at all the things that we've done as they're brought to our remembrance, does it not break us? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Well, David, with all his faults, was able to plead his righteousness and his integrity that he sought to live out the life as a believer as one who will give account before the living God well thirdly and briefly we would notice from verses 32 to verse 51 the end we have David's kingdom and here he talks about the battles he fought. 
And we might look at this lightly and say that David is somewhat bloodthirsty here. But we must always bear in mind that David was not a private individual here. Or he was not speaking as a private individual. He was a public person. He was the Lord's anointed. He was the head of the kingdom of God. And God had plans for his people, for Israel. Plans that would bring about the salvation of people. For salvation is of the Jews. And it was through the Jews that God was going to bring the gospel. And it was vitally important that God's people were in their land and that they had occupied the land that was given to them and that they were able to subdue their enemies round about them and that they were able to live in peace and in safety in order that the kingdom of God might advance and that God's plans and purposes to bring about the salvation of all his people, Jew and Gentile, would be accomplished. And David had a work to do. He had to unite Israel first and foremost. He did that. Then he had to turn his attention to his enemies round about him. And firstly, when he became the king, they turned their attention upon him. And therefore he was on the defensive. But latterly he went on the offensive and began to subdue these nations round about him. Because he was fighting the Lord's battles. And do remember... When people talk about how bloodthirsty the Bible is and how the people of God eradicated nations, seven nations before them in the promised land, you must remember that God had given these nations plenty of time and plenty of opportunity to repent. But they would not. They were hardened in their sins and they were living godless horrible lives full of all kinds of moral filth and violence and David was there executing God's judgment upon them after they had been given every opportunity to repent David's kingdom was established and we might more accurately say the kingdom of God was established. And God's man was there. And the work of God was going on. And it reminds us, friends, in our application, it reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, it reminds us of him, of David's greater son. Because ultimately, this all points to Christ and to his kingdom, which will be an eternal kingdom. And as David destroyed his enemies and God's enemies, so the Lord Jesus Christ will. Yes, that one who is meek and mild, that one who came from heaven to seek and to save that which was lost, will one day be a judge and a destroyer to those who are his enemies if they will but not come and repent and believe the gospel. We don't like to think upon it. We don't like to meditate upon it. And the world hates it. But friends, the truth is that the day will come when his enemies shall be made his footstool. David was able to subdue his enemies. They were in some sense his footstool. Do you think that David's greater son will not triumph? He will. The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. This happened in a very smaller sense with David when he subdued the kingdoms round about him. 
But Christ will do that universally. He's about it tonight. He's building his kingdom. And therefore, friends, we are to be part of that kingdom. And we are to come and to, we are to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to pray. We are to take up the Lord's Prayer. Whether you look upon the Lord's Prayer as a prayer or as a pattern for prayer. It tells us, Thy kingdom come. And when we utter these words, we are asking the Lord Jesus Christ to come and to build his kingdom and to extend his kingdom. And to do that, we're asking him to overthrow the kingdom of darkness. This is what David did. All of these people were in opposition to the plans and purposes of the Lord God Almighty. And David was one who overthrew them all by his great God. And so this points to the victory that Jesus Christ will secure one day. How does he do it? He does it by securing one's here, one's there, one's here. That's what happens. Tonight, friends, we are to be in that kingdom. We are to receive the invitation and to be part of that kingdom. And we are to come and embrace him and to be in the kingdom and to delight that we are part of the kingdom of Christ. David then in that reflective mode he praises God. He reflects upon his own righteousness not to boast but to make it clear that he sought to live out a believer's life. And David's kingdom was secure and settled and flourishing, as indeed is Christ's kingdom, secure and flourishing. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. And may the Lord be pleased to bless his word to us. Let us pray together.